Hello, my name is Paul Friedman. I'm chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I'm delighted to have with me today my colleague, Dr. Tais Cotino. Dr. Cotino trained with us a number of years ago, went to Canada for approximately a decade, where she headed the Women's Heart Health Clinic in Ottawa and was chair of the Canadian Women's Heart Health Center, and now has returned to Mayo Clinic, where uh, she works in our aorta center on preventive cardiology. Tice, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much, Dr. Freeman. Happy to join you today. So today we're going to talk about hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. So start off by telling us what they are. Yes, yeah, so hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are fairly common. They affect about 5 to 10% of all pregnancies. So that's a huge number if you think about it in absolute numbers. And they are a collection of disorders. So if, some, if a woman is already hypertensive and then becomes pregnant, that's one of them. Um, if they've developed gestational hypertension during their pregnancy, that's another HDP or hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. Of course, preeclampsia and eclampsia. Or if a chronically hypertensive woman then has a superimposed preeclampsia during their pregnancy, that's also considered a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. Now, one of the things that's of greatest interest to those of us who don't take care of women during pregnancy, but see many women later in life is, what are the implications of having had a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy down the road? Are there things we should be aware of? Yes, that's a, a super important question. I think there's an overall low level of knowledge among women out there and also among providers about the future cardiovascular consequences of having a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. I think, like I told you earlier, it's a fairly common disease. So there are lots of women year after year that are going to be experiencing these pregnancy complications. However, once the placenta is delivered, most of the times the blood pressure tends to normalize over time. Not always, but it does often. And I think a lot of patients and providers see this as uh, a chapter of the book that they can close. Okay, I can turn this page. This is now in my past and, and let's move on. But what we do now know with very robust data, we're talking about meta-analyses with over 5 million women. We know that this is not just a chapter in a woman's life. If a woman has had a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, their risk of future cardiovascular disease, the relative risk, is substantially increased. And I'll give you some examples. If a woman has had uh, preeclampsia, for example, her risk of having chronic hypertension for the rest of her life is four times higher than an age-matched woman that had normal tensive pregnancies. The risk of heart failure is also fourfold increased. The risk of stroke is increased by 80%. The risk of arrhythmias, about 50% higher. The risk of heart attack, about two to three fold increase and oh. cardiovascular mortality is also two and a half times higher. Not only that, but there's also a, a dose response relationship that we observe in, in the sense that the more severe the pregnancy complication, the higher these risks are going to be. So some examples here is that if you have gestational hypertension, you have increased risk, all of these risks. However, if you have preeclampsia, the risks will be even higher. If you had preeclampsia early in your pregnancy, typically defined before 32 or 35 weeks, just, uh, 32 to 34 weeks gestation, depending on what you read. If you had early preeclampsia, there's also a further increase in the risk as compared to hyper, uh, preeclampsia later in pregnancy. Recurrent preeclampsia has the same dose response. Preeclampsia that is complicated with IUGR or fetal demise further elevates that risk. So there's definitely a dose response here. And importantly, these diseases, cardiovascular diseases, if they are to occur in these women, they tend to occur prematurely. So uh, the CHAMP study, which was a study out of Ontario many years ago, one of the pioneer studies in this field, had shown that the average time between having the hypertensive disorder of pregnancy and having a first cardiovascular event was only 10 years. So these women could be having heart attacks and strokes in their 30s and 40s, for example. So they're all things that we have to take into consideration when we see patients in our practices to incorporate that information into cardiovascular risk assessments. Those are really staggering statistics, both in terms of the number of people affected and in terms of the magnitude of the effect. And it's clear that there is a lingering vascular biological effect from these hypertensive emergencies, which leads to uh, rather hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And that leads, of course, 
to a number of questions, but, but before going into some of those, from a pragmatic standpoint, how should a clinician approach a patient who has a history of a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy? And what questions should we ask? It's not one of the risk factors that most clinicians ask about. They're asking about smoking and family history, but less commonly do we get a detailed pregnancy history in adults who, um, in women who may have had children 10, 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So what would be your suggestion for how we approach it? Yeah, you hit the nail uh, right on the head. So just to put some, these, some of these numbers in perspective for clinicians, I think when we see a patient with chest pain or we see a patient that, you know, for primary prevention, cardiovascular risk estimation, we think, we ask them, are you diabetic, right? We, everybody recognized diabetes as a potent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. However, if you look at the actual odds ratios, a, a, a diabetes will double to triple a person's future risk for cardiovascular disease. Well, I just told you the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy tend to do at least that. So kind of put that into perspective that this is a powerful risk factor. Mm -hmm. But then the other side of this evaluation here is to also remember that this is a relative risk. The far majority of women who have had a hypertensive disorder or pregnancy will not have any problems because, you know, these are young women. So we young women, thankfully, are going to be fine. So the majority of them are going to be okay. But relatively to other young women, the risk is substantially increased. So I use that information also as I counsel my patients, because as you start to talk about this risk to patients, you can see their eyes start to pop up and they go into a panic. And it's important that we pass this information to them. Listen, your risk is relatively higher, but chances are nothing will happen. But we just need to know these risks so we can work together early on to mitigate them. So that's one uh, perspective that I would give to clinicians. Second perspective is we should all be asking a very brief pregnancy history. In today's podcast, we're here focusing on the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. However, there are other parts of OBGYN history that are also important that we can discuss perhaps in a different podcast. But for the purpose of HDP, uh, you know, it takes absolutely no money and a very small period of time to ask this question. So when I see my patient, either if they have a cardiovascular symptom or concern that I'm investigating, or if I'm simply assessing risk, it's a very simple standard question. How many pregnancies have you had? Uh, how many children have you had, live children? Uh, have you had gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, eclampsia? How many of your pregnancies were affected? Did you have IUGR? Did you have premature birth? Did you have fetal demise? Obviously, you can ask with uh, more uh, uh, lay terms, but this takes one minute. And then you substantially increase your ability to understand this woman's cardiovascular risk. And once we know that, that bit of information, we need to start working with these women right away. Now, right? This, I told you how premature cardiovascular disease is a real thing in this population. So we don't have the luxury of time of waiting until they're 40 to get their first lipid panel. So once a woman has been diagnosed with HDP, uh, you know, you give them about six months to, you know, adapt to the new life with the newborn and, you know, get their everything in order. Then you start to talk about the risks. And then every year subsequently, this woman needs to have all the risk factors in, in check. That she needs to be counseled, that she needs to try to regain her, her pre-baby weight within that first year. She needs to continue refraining from smoking, which I think it's obvious to everyone. Uh, she, we need to measure her blood pressure very carefully every year. These women tend to disappear into the healthcare system because they're young. So every year they need to have their blood pressure assessed. They need to have their cholesterol checked with the caveat that lactation increases cholesterol. So you just have to take that into effect. However, once lactation is complete, let's assess the cholesterol and treat appropriately. Let's uh, really implement diet and exercise interventions that we know are helpful in mitigating risk to really get the woman we in, with the best arsenal early on to decrease her risk overall in the, in the long term. From a more practical perspective, uh, I always say that this cardiovascular risk after HDP is kind of medicine's best kept secret because there's so much information out there documenting the risk. It's a very robust. However, that's where the, uh, the, the um, information stops. We know the risk very well, but we do not know how to, what to do with the risk after. So for clinicians that are listening, 
there are a couple of things that we know to do. First, all of the lifestyle measures I spoke about a second ago apply on a yearly basis forever. Two, uh, there have been some expert documents and some national guidelines that have suggested that you can use these adverse pregnancy complications as risk enhancers. So, for example, let's say you see a 50-year-old woman with chest pain and you're trying to understand her cardiovascular risk. You can use your favorite risk calculator, calculate her risk, and let's say she lands in an intermediate risk category. Now you can apply that knowledge of the hypertensive disorder of pregnancy as a risk enhancer that actually will qualify this woman for a statin, for example. Mm-hmm. So this, these are some of the more practical ways, but there's certainly a lot to be learned about what to do with that information that we know about. Yeah, no, it's super helpful, practical, and informative, um, but there's a lot to be learned. So tell us about some of your research in the field. You've been very active in this space. Yes, I am very interested in preeclampsia. So uh, on a broader term, I study aortic health and function, arterial function, and how abnormalities in aortic health and function can play a role in different cardiovascular diseases, typically with a sex-specific lens. So that's kind of the, the central aspect of our research. And within that scope, I have taken a significant interest in the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy for all of the reasons that we have discussed. But as a clinician, when I see you know, 5 to 10% of all pregnancies, that's, I don't know how many millions and millions of women just in the United States alone are we talking about. Now, think about this for a moment. I'm just here saying that as of right now, we have to deploy lifelong primary prevention measures and evaluations for these women. Imagine the healthcare costs of all of that, right? For the you know, decades and decades to come. So in my mind, it would be ideal if we can look at this big pool of 5 to 10% of women that have HDP and try to identify and kind of cherry pick which ones of them are truly at increased risk. Because a number of them, the majority of them won't be, but we don't know who they are. So how can we cherry pick the truly high risk women? And I have used the measures of aortic health and function, which are excellent surrogates of future cardiovascular risk, to try to understand whose arteries may be already, you know, on fire, as I like to to say informally to my trainees. So in that concept, um, I have studied women postpartum. They were anywhere between six months to five years postpartum. So not early enough that they still have hemodynamics or pregnancy going on, but not too late that the train has left the station. So in that kind of five-year period. And I have evaluated the aortic health and function. So to summarize some of our findings, We have shown, not for the first time, we were not the first to show this, but we have confirmed the fact that women's after, and these were preeclamptic patients, so women after preeclampsia certainly have stiffer aortas. Then our novel contribution here is that we actually evaluated a whole breadth of aortic hemodynamics and pretty much show that every single aspect of arterial hemodynamics are abnormal in this population. But then we have also demonstrated a dose response effect where the vascular abnormalities were the worst if the woman had preeclampsia with severe features or oh. early preeclampsia or recurrent preeclampsia. To give you an idea, just to put this in very easy terms that everybody can understand, we have found that the vascular age of a preeclamptic woman, six to five years postpartum, is about seven to 11 years older than controls. So their That's vascular really aging stunning. process, right, significant increase in the vascular aging process, which is interesting when I when you kind of go back to the clinical knowledge that their events occur earlier in life. Well, their, their blood vessels are aging a lot faster, and I think that correlates with that. And lastly, most recently, we have also explored the role of central obesity and how it interplays with this population. So we looked at our control patients and our patients with preeclampsia, And among them, we separated those that remained centrally obese, according to WHO definition, postpartum, versus the one that recouped the baby weight and did not have central obesity. And we found that if a preeclamptic woman did not have central obesity, their aortic hemodynamic abnormalities were very minimal. However, the ones that had a history of preeclampsia but then remained centrally obese, they had the worst vascular abnormality. So I think with this knowledge of vascular health, we can start to understand the women who are already on a trajectory towards cardiovascular events and perhaps start to deploy some of our resources towards these right, higher-risk people. 
That raises so many questions. Um, I'll, I'll ask just one or two. Yeah. Um, the first one is, do you think the powerful new weight loss drugs, the GLP-1 agonists, could change that trajectory, or is it too early to say? I think it's, it's too early to say. I think all of us working in any cardiovascular field have been positively impacted by some of the results from these drugs right. in uh, so many clinical trials. So I think there is definitely hope that we can alter the trajectory, not only because of the weight loss itself, but also the overall cardiovascular benefits. You know, even if you just think about it from a very simple perspective, if somebody is obese, they're less likely to, to have enough strength and stamina perhaps to engage in the adequate amounts of exercise. You know, th that obviously doesn't go for everyone, but it can be for some patients. And sometimes simply by decreasing the weight, well, now they have the ability to actually achieve those 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise on, on a weekly basis that we recommend. And, the, and exercise in itself is the greatest antioxidant there is and, you know, yeah. significant positive uh, outcomes. So just, you know, obviously this is only one way that I can see, but I definitely hold out hope. But everything I say today is purely speculative. We have to, to wait and see. What about um, SCAD? So is the mechanism purely atherosclerosis or is there an increased risk or um, SCAD in women who have had hypertensive disorder in their pregnancy? You know, excellent question. I am unaware of any papers that have specifically looked at a direct pathway. There's some data that I'm not allowed to disclose at the moment, but I would just say hold out. Uh, there's some data okay. from our institution uh, that is actually evaluating um, non-atherosclerotic MI. Uh, mm -hmm. in this population, but maybe we have to come back and talk about that in a different podcast. We absolutely will. You've piqued my interest. Yeah. Um, and that leads really to what my, my last question. We've touched on a few, but what do you see as really the major gaps in our understanding that should drive future research uh, questions and clinical translation in the field? A really, really great question. I'll tell you my opinion. I'm sure different people, we have different opinions about this, but like I mentioned earlier, the the risk itself is poorly uh, documented. I'm talking about meta-analysis with 5 million women. We have that data. What we need now is what do we do next? How do we incorporate this data into standard cardiovascular risk scores? Does it improve cardiovascular risk scoring uh, in, in, or in which patients does it do? How do we incorporate that information into clinical practice effectively is one of the things that has to be explored uh, in, in longitudinal cohort mm -hmm. studies. And I think the other piece that is still greatly needed at this time is on the therapeutic side. Again, we know the risk is there, but how do we treat that risk? So identifying the best therapeutic strategies that are going to mitigate that risk and identifying to in whom we have to apply these therapeutic strategies, I think remains a significant area of, uh, of, you know, in terms of an open field for research that is very, very much needed in this population. And in that context, perhaps identifying novel therapeutic targets. Uh, my bias in this field is, uh, is now aortic function and arterial function in the hemodynamics. So can we target those abnormalities early on to try to modify their trajectory towards cardiovascular risk. So I think those are all important questions that remain unanswered, uh, but hopefully in the coming decades, we have answers to them. A fascinating space, really helping us understand, I think, ultimately mechanisms of why hypertensive disorders or pregnancy so powerfully affect atherosclerosis and vascular biology, and it impacts so many people. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your insights with us, Dr. Cortino. Pleasure to speak with you on this topic. Thanks so much for having me.